just invite you to turn to Philippians 1 with me. We're in a series going through this letter to the church at Philippi. And last week we took a brief break as we celebrated the Lord's table. The week before that, Gary Holcomb talked to us about the mind of Christ, mainly looking at the first few verses in Philippians 2. And the week before that, we spent time as sort of a, an introductory way looking at who the author to the Philippians is, and that is Paul himself. And we talked about what it means that we say he was an apostle and the fact that that means a very special authority by which not only did the church recognize that he was speaking for God, but Paul himself believed that. And today we're, we aim to cover chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, in a sermon I have entitled, A Church We Should Want to Be Like. And so follow along with me in your Bibles as we look at Philippians 1, beginning with verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Let's pause and just ask God to bless His word and our reception of it this morning. Father, thank you for gathering us this morning to not just fellowship with one another, but to experience you and to hear from your voice. For the next many moments, Lord, would you open up our spiritual eyes so that we could see? Would you breathe upon our hearts that we could be receptive to exactly what you have to show us in these five simple verses? And we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Parents are not supposed to have a favorite child above their other children. We're supposed to love our children equally. However, that does not mean that we are emotionless when it comes to a particular child's activity or accomplishment or the way they might mature in some way. It doesn't mean that we're emotionless if we have a child who all year has struggled with algebra, and they finally land their first A. We make a, a bit of fuss about that first A. And therefore, even though we're supposed to love all of our children equally, it doesn't mean that there are, certain, are not certain seasons in the lives of all of our kids that we celebrate because of certain accomplishments or graduations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the reason I bring that up is because, in a sense... When Paul writes to this church in Philippi, it's almost as if he's talking to his own children. All of his churches were churches that he planted. There were six of them. And when it comes to his writings, you see him sometimes praising them and being proud of them and excited and other times uh, being a little hard on them. Why? Because he viewed them as his own children. And I want to say something about the particular book that we're in this morning that might be a little bit controversial and you are free to disagree with me after the sermon. But I believe that when Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, they were his favorite church. I believe that when Paul wrote to Philippi, he had a very special place in his heart for this particular church. Now, if you're not following with me yet, and you're just kind of waiting to say, okay, Greg, we'll see how you prove that. First of all, let's say that as a parent, you have six children, and you're getting up in years, and you're facing your twilight years where you can no longer take care of yourself. And let's say, for illustration's sake, that all six of your children invite you to come live with them. And so you have to pick one of them. You're going to pick, whether you have a favorite or not, whether you you know, are insistent on you have no favorites, you're going to pick one of the children that you get along with the best, that there seems to be a, a personality 
compatibility. Your temperaments do well together. And in the same way, when we look at Paul writing to this particular church, of all six churches that he planted, I picture the church at Philippi as the church that he would have wanted to retire in if Paul knew that word. Uh, were it not for his martyrdom, I picture the church at Philippi as a church that he, would ju- he just felt so comfortable with, more so than the other churches. It was this church in chapter 4, verse 1, that we read, he called them his beloved, the one whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. Why? Why did Paul view this church that way? And for the next few moments, I want to ask that question, why? Why was there a special place in Paul's heart concerning this church? And in looking at three observations, why, I then want to make the argument that this is a church we should want to be like. So on the back of your bulletin, there are three observations about this church. Number one, a church that partnered. They were a church that partnered. We're going to see what that means. Number two, a church that listened. And number three, a church that submitted. Again, a church that partnered, a church that listened. Thirdly, a church that submitted. So let's see what that means, and let's see how we see that in these first five verses of Philippians 1. Number one, a church that partnered. If your Bibles are open to chapter 1, we've read verses 1 through 5, but focus with me on verse 3 for just a moment. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Just plain and simple, as Paul is writing these words from prison, the church at Philippi took care of him. Plain and simple, they took care of his needs. And and this is hard for us to think of in in the right context because of our own uh, American system of incarceration. When we think of an American prison, as, as horrible as it would be to be in an American prison, prisoners have a pillow. American prisoners have a bed. American prisoners have food every day. And in many cases, American prisoners even have medical attention. Not so for Paul, not so in this day. Because Paul is living at a time in a place where to be a prisoner in a Roman prison meant that any of your supplies, including food, were brought in from the outside. They were not on the inside. And so you were dependent on friends and family to tend to your needs on a daily basis. And that's what Paul is living like. He was dependent upon outward help. And so during this time in a Roman prison, uh, someone who had a prison sentence, it, it was almost synonymous with a death sentence. And so whether Paul is in prison sort of like a house arrest situation, which many scholars say, or whether he was chained personally to one soldier, or whether he had the the worst of the worst, which would be to be in the Mamertine dungeon, one thing is for sure, he's not in Mayberry. Sheriff Andy is not bringing a home-cooked meal and pushing it through the bars that Aunt B just cooked. He is in trouble, and he's totally dependent on outside help. And again, the church at Philippi, being hundreds of miles away, partnered with him. And the question then becomes how? Well, they pick a representative. They pick a helper to actually bring him supplies and bring him food. And that helper's name was Epaphroditus. Look at chapter 4 for just a moment. Turn just a couple of pages over, Philippians 4, and look in the middle of verse 15. Philippians 4, middle of verse 15. Paul writes, When I left Macedonia... No church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. 
I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And so when we ask the question, how did this church partner with Paul? It might help to think of Paul in prison in Rome, but to think of Timothy with him as far as in the the general city, and probably Luke too. Maybe they had lodged with some friends. Maybe they were staying in someone's home. And so Timothy and Luke were in Rome, and it might help to think of them as, as having the administrative how. This is how we can go into the prison and help Paul and make sure that he is fed every day. But what we lack on a regular basis, since this is a two-year sentence, is food and money. It, It will get expensive. And as soon as the church at Philippi hear of this need, they stop everything. And they push away all of their agendas in their next leadership meeting and they face this one need. We have got to help Paul. Let's send someone whose specific job is to be there for him and to provide food and money and even medical attention if he needs it. And that person's name was Epaphroditus. And if we were to look at a map of where Philippi is in relation to where Rome is, I think we have a map on the screen. I want you to notice that on the far upper uh, right part under the Black Sea is Philippi. See, just to the west of the Black Sea. And so Epaphroditus, by a long ship voyage, had to go down south under Greece, under the southern toe of Italy, up to where Rome is, and then had to trek through land to finally get to Paul. This was no simple voyage. In fact, uh, scholars say that this voyage by ship, depending on the weather, took between seven to eight weeks. And we think that Epaphroditus did this three separate times. This was something they took very seriously to such an extent that part of the reason Paul is writing this letter in the first place has to do with one of the times Epaphroditus was traveling, he got deathly sick. And the church at Philippi got word of it. And Paul writes this very letter to assure them that he's okay, even though he was seriously ill. And so we now see that there's something very important in realizing that Paul's needs were completely met every time. I want you to notice that when we go back to chapter 1, verse 5, Paul's gratefulness is expressed this way, quote, from the first day until now, you have cared for me. In other words, his entire time in prison. Wow. How incredible this provision was. And so they were a church that partnered. Let's look secondly at why Paul had a very special place in his heart for this church. They were a church that listened. A church that listened. And we could say that they listened for a number of different reasons. But there's something actually in verse 1 that triggers the reason I say that they were a listening church. Look at verse 1 again with me in Philippians 1. Paul and Timothy servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Now, what does that have to do with a church that listens? I didn't see anything in there about listening. Well, we need to realize that every time Paul planted a church, and again, there were six of them, he gave instructions to each of those churches concerning leadership. And it wasn't just leadership in general, it was a very specific kind of leadership. He instructed every church to put in place overseers and deacons. Why? So that they would be self-sufficient, so that he could continue and plant other churches as they grew in maturity without him. The word overseer is the Greek word episkopor, and it might be translated as bishop, or elder, or pastor, 
And the word overseer is very appropriate as well. The word deacon is the Greek word diakonoi. And it means minister or servant or even servant leader. And it's not our purpose this morning to go in depth as to what those mean in the church. Uh, we could do that by looking at Titus or First Timothy. But what we do want to mention is simply this, and I think this is on the screen for you. In writings outside of Philippians, while Paul lists overseers and deacons in his instructions concerning church government, he never once mentions that any of his churches actually listened and obeyed and put overseers and deacons in place. Philippi was the only church where we see evidence that they took him seriously on this. And that's not just a, a mere fun fact. This, is, this has huge ramifications. Because I want you to think for just a moment of the way that Paul talked to his other churches. For example, in Galatia, Paul went on and on and on having to correct them concerning false teachers that were trying to drag them back into Judaism. Well, guess what was missing in the church at Galatia? Overseers and deacons. In Corinth, Paul had to go on and on correcting the church concerning their immorality and a lack of order in their worship services and the way they abuse spiritual gifts. And guess what just happens to be missing in the church at Corinth? There's not one time a mention of overseers and deacons. And with every church, we could say that except for the church in Philippi. In fact, it's in the very first verse. Almost in passing, Paul mentions, you've put overseers and deacons in place. And because of that, because they listened to Paul and obeyed Paul in this, it kept them out of a lot of trouble. In fact, when I think of the church at Philippi, I think a little bit of one of the churches that John wrote to in Revelation. You remember that early on in Revelation, John writes to seven different churches. And there was one church that he only praises and never rebukes. It was the church in Philadelphia. And in the same way, this was the one church that Paul wrote to that seem to keep themselves clean. He never rebukes them for anything. There's no corporate correction concerning any issues. Why? They listen. And in a similar way as if we went back to the uh, analogy of raising children. And of course, we don't have favorites. But I want you to imagine that you've raised six children and in their young adulthood, you teach them how to manage money. And you sit down with each one very carefully and you teach them how to stay out of debt and how to save and how to invest wisely. And off they go. But five years later, one by one, they come back to you. And sure enough, your kids are already facing bankruptcy. One has a problem in gambling. One has a problem that because they never budgeted correctly, they're just always upside down in debt. One after the other after the other. You know, some kids listen better than others. Again, in all of that web of financial problems, it doesn't mean that you love any of them less. It just means, wow, if only you had listened, it would have been a far different story. And that's part of what we see in this church in Philippi. And of course, by saying they listened, what is implied in that is that they obeyed. And it kept them out of so much trouble. Paul was proud of this church. And he calls them his crown and his joy. And so that's number two. It was a church that listened. Let's look at number three now. A church that submitted. A church that submitted. And in a way, I think that this is the most important. And I think that really, if it weren't for the way they submitted to Paul, I don't think that we would have the first two. Because if we ask the question, why did they partner with him so willingly? Well, because they listened. Okay, well, why did they listen to him so attentively? It's because they submitted. They submitted to his apostolic authority as being a voice of God. And this was huge. Sometimes what is not in a verse speaks volumes. And if you're 
Bibles are still open to Philippians 1, and you're glancing at verses 1 through 5, that sort of represents what we would call the greeting. And in every letter, Paul gives a greeting. And in every letter to all of his churches, what do we always see in his greeting? He mentions that he's an apostle. But what do we not see in this greeting? He nowhere mentions his apostolic authority. In fact, the word apostle is never seen in the entire letter. Now, scholars marvel at that omission. And hands down, it's pretty unanimous why Paul in no place flexes his authoritative muscles, as it were. He didn't need to. This was a church that submitted to his authority. And this cannot be missed. And we began looking at this about three weeks ago, didn't we? We live in a day where many people, authors, modern-day theologians, question the authority of the writers of the Bible. And oftentimes, the case is made that, well, when Paul was writing, he didn't believe he was writing authoritatively. He was just writing a letter. And decades later, the church fathers, quote-unquote, decided it was Scripture. Or even worse, centuries later, some church council, quote-unquote, decided it was Scripture. Folks, as we pointed out three weeks ago, nothing could be further from the truth. And the problem with that idea of saying that as James was writing, or as Peter was writing, or as Paul was writing, they had no idea they were being the voice of God, the problem with that idea is that the next step is to say, well, since they didn't believe they were writing of God, we too should take their words as just opinion. Which means we could sort of use it as good wisdom in life, some helpful tips, but not as from God. Now, Jesus' words, that's a little bit different, but, you know, James never meant us to take his words so seriously. Paul never meant us to take his words so seriously. And on and on it goes. I want you to remind us, and, and this is just a sort of a, a reminder from three weeks ago, of what Paul himself said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. Look at it on the screen with me. The things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Remember what St. Peter said of Paul's writings in 2 Peter 3, the middle of verse 16. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other, what's the last word? Scriptures. Peter, the, the rock, the one that Jesus gave the keys to the kingdom, Peter said that Paul's writings were Scripture before there was even Scripture as far as we see it as a collection of books. And so the point is very simple. When Paul was writing he did believe that his words were authoritative. Not only that, but the early church even took his verbal words as being seriously authoritative. We need to realize that as Paul or Peter or James spoke and taught, their words were not authoritative, sort of like an on and off button when they picked up a pen. Off, on, off, on. No, even when they taught verbally, they considered their words authoritative and from God. That's why early in Acts, what did the early church give themselves to? This was days after the ascension. They gave themselves to the breaking of bread, fellowship, prayer, and the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching. That was decades before anything was written down by the apostles. Theologian and Dutch historian Herman Bavnik long ago wrote something that I think is helpful here. Quote, As long as the apostles were alive and visited the churches, no distinction was made between their spoken and written word. Tradition and scripture were still unified. But when the first period was passed and time distance from the apostles grew greater, 
their writings became more important, and the necessity of the writings gradually intensified. In other words, what the apostles spoke verbally was always important to the early church. And what they wrote down was important. But when they started to die, and when the church realized, hey, we no longer have Peter with us to say, Peter, what did you mean by this? And Paul, in this writing, what did you mean by this? When the church realized that, then the writings became even more treasured and important to them. And yet there are many today who deny that the apostles were ever conscious of the fact that they wrote in a special way and they taught in a special way. And there's an, a, a specific objection that I want to bring up. What about, Pastor Greg, what about 1 Corinthians 7? And three weeks ago I said I promised that I would come back to this, so if you want to look at this with me, turn to 1 Corinthians 7 because the, quest, the objection comes in the form of a question. Pastor Greg, in 1 Corinthians 7, doesn't Paul specifically say, this, this part of what I'm writing is my opinion, but this part is from God? Isn't that what Paul says? So let's read it together. Paul is writing about marriage and divorce, and here's what he said. In 1 Corinthians 7, 10, verse 10, To the married I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If, anyone, if any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. And the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. So, there it is, right? Paul just said in black and white that what I'm writing is just merely my opinion. It's not from God, right? Wrong. First of all, notice this. And I think that this is on the screen. When Paul says in verse 10, to the married I give this charge, not I, but the Lord, he is declaring where this original charge came from. In other words, he's saying, what I'm saying here originally came from Jesus. Jesus, the Lord. By the way, every time in the New Testament that people refer to the Lord, who are they referring to? Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus. When Thomas reached out and, and touched Jesus' nail-pierced hand, he said, my Lord and my God. Capital L, lowercase o-r-d. When Mary was at the empty tomb and the angel appeared to her. She said what? They have taken my Lord and I do not know where they have placed him. And so whenever Paul here says that this is something that the Lord said, not I, what is he saying? He's saying that this little part, this little teaching about divorce and marriage is something that Jesus has already addressed. I'm not making this part up. Jesus already said it. And sure enough, if you look at Mark 10, verses 1 through 12, you'll see that Jesus did already say all of that. Peter just reiterates it. But then, in verse 12, Paul says something brand new that Jesus never said. And he says this, I not the Lord. In other words, he's saying, now I'm saying something that Jesus didn't say. And what did he say? In a nutshell, he said that when you are married as a believer to an unbeliever, and that unbeliever is, is fine with staying married, you should stay with that unbeliever. And in writing it out, 
in staying faithful to that spouse, they are, quote-unquote, made holy. Now, that does not mean that they're automatically justified and they do not have to have a personal faith. What it does mean, however, is that there is a sanctification work in that unbelieving spouse's heart. There's a godly influence that you may not be able to see. God is working. Do not underestimate what God is doing in that turkey's life. Stay married to that rascal. Don't get divorced. And Paul's entire point is this. Jesus never said that. I'm saying it right now. And so from Paul's perspective, we might think of it like this. He's thinking, I just said two things about divorce. The first thing I said came from authoritative source A, which is Jesus. The second thing I said comes from authoritative source B, which is me. Both are authoritative, but Jesus said the first one. That's another way of thinking about this. By the way, another problem with taking this passage and saying, well, this is just Paul's opinion, is we then have to ask, well, where does it stop? Does Paul intend on just his quote-unquote opinion to stop two verses later, two chapters later, two books later? No, this was always his authoritative position. He always was speaking authoritatively. In fact, if you were to turn over to chapter 9, verse 1, Paul clearly says, Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? So personally, seeing Jesus Christ the Lord and being commissioned by Him, that was a prerequisite to being an apostle. And constantly to the church at Corinth, Paul had to remind them of his authority. And it doesn't change here. And yet, again, we go back to the church at Philippi. They never had to be reminded of that. He never has to go on and on about reminding them of how authoritatively he's speaking. The word apostle is nowhere to be found in Philippi. This is a church we should want to be like. They were a church that partnered, They were a church that listened. And most importantly, as we see in that point, they were a church that submitted to his every word because they believed his words came directly from God. So where does that leave us this morning? What would be some application to take home with us? Well, let me just ask a couple of questions in closing. And I want to let the Holy Spirit to simply deal with our individual hearts as a body of Christ, as Grace Bible Fellowship, I just want to ask this question. Are we a church that partners with other churches? Are we a church that partners with church planters? Are we a church that partners with missionaries? Are we a church that partners with others who are building God's kingdom? And and really, probably more poignantly to this letter, Dare I even ask, are we a church that partners with Christians today who are in prison? I can't help but to think of that because just one month ago, Andrew Brunson, a pastor in Turkey, was arrested. And from October 2016 to one month ago, he was in prison. Ladies and gentlemen, there are Christians today who are in prison because of their faith. Are we a church who partners? Second question, are we a church that listens? Are we a church that listens? The church at Philippi had Paul himself as their leader. They listened to him. And of course, even though as an apostle, he carried a greater authority with him than leaders in the church today. But did you know that God has placed leaders in the church today as well? Not with the same authority, but still with authority. In fact, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you.
You know, occasionally I bump into someone who tries to make a case against the importance of church membership. And they argue that, you know, being a member of a local church just is not all that important. I see no precedence for it in the Bible at all. Folks, being a member of a church is vital if for no other reason than you are narrowing down who the leaders in your life are. Because in Hebrews, the author there, when he says, obey your leaders, he does not have in mind every leader around the world. He has in mind a specific group of leaders within the local church. You know, as I, as I think of that passage in Hebrews 13, 7, and as I think of this question, are we a church that listens? I, I have a, a painful memory of two faces in my mind from long ago. And one person went off and did something without asking any leaders in the church. And it was pretty major. The other person asked us first, and we gave them some counsel based on God's word, and they did the opposite of it. And in both of those painful memories that I have of those two faces, if they had simply listened, it would have saved them so much heartache, so much headache. It would have saved them financially, and it would have certainly saved them some relationships that they lost. They didn't listen. And of course, when we think of leaders today, Again, we're not, none of us in this church are leaders with a capital L. Even though God has appointed leaders, in, in this church we call overseers elders, but even our Sunday school teachers are leaders. They are deacons. We would call them leaders. And even though we're not apostolic in the sense of canonical authority, God has placed leaders in the church for a reason. And we will have to give an account someday to God as to how we gave wisdom to people. And we're sinners just like everybody. We're being sanctified just like everybody. And so whenever someone asks for wisdom, boy, if, if, if we're a leader in this church, we better humbly point to God's word for what he's already said because we too are being shaped by that. Are we a church that listens? God has given us leaders. Thirdly and finally, are we a church that submits? And here we are talking about ultimate authority. We're talking about God's Word. Are we a church that submits to this book, inspired by the Holy Spirit through human authors? And maybe another way to ask that question is, as a church, is there a single sentence in this Word by which we would say, oh, that's just an opinion? Is there a single line, a single verse in this book by which we would say, you know, that's not relevant for today. That was their opinion, but, you know, they were born on the wrong side of history. That's not 21st century at all. Are we a church that submits? Ladies and gentlemen, the church at Philippi is a church we should want to be like. A church that partnered, a church that listened, and a church that submitted. Would you pray with me this morning?